Every couture season, there are only a handful of brands that I really look forward to seeing, which is a shame really, considering that haute couture is the highest level of dressmaking. But only a couple of brands combine awe-inspiring craftsmanship with a collection that looks and feels as ambitious, that demands applaud whether you are into fashion or aren't. Maison Margiela and Victor and Rolf do a great job getting inventive every couture week while still reaching this standard. But Iris Van Herpen and Schiaparelli seem to be the brands that are consistently smashing past that standard, rightfully making them the talk of couture week. Although Schiaparelli really only found its voice in today's fashion world since Daniel Rosebery joined in 2019, and Iris Van Herpen has been showing since 2011, I think Schiaparelli has become my favorite couture brand. It's been amazing to see the brand get so big and the attention that Schiaparelli as a brand and designer deserves since Daniels first started innovating there only eight seasons ago. It's crazy how far the brand has come and I think Schiaparelli is only going to grow bigger as it becomes synonymous with haute couture. So how did Daniel Rosebery do it? And how did he do it in so little time? Let's find out, shall we? I feel like at this point the story of Elsa Schiaparelli has been told a lot since the brand has come back into the spotlight. So I'll keep it super brief. I want this video to be more about Daniel Roseberry and what he's done with the brand. Anyway, Elsa Schiaparelli was an Italian surrealist artist that worked in the same circles as Salvador Dali, Man Ray, and Andre Cocteau, all great surrealist artists. They worked in painting, photography, and poetry respectively. Elsa's medium was fashion. She actually worked with some of these artists on certain items, equivalent to a modern day collaboration. I wonder if they're only hype beasts at the time lining up to get that new Dali Schiaparelli dress. She was undoubtedly unique in fashion and as a personality. You might have seen her wearing some pretty simple but sharply tailored and chic clothing during the day, but at night, at the various parties she attended and through herself, she would dress as outlandish as possible with her creations. And this was how you could best describe her clothes, really. Elegant to super silly but fun. She was the embodiment of the surrealist movement through her clothes, but also one of the earliest avant-garde fashion designers who undoubtedly merged art and fashion design. Eventually, her style went out of fashion, so her house went bankrupt and she retired, later dying at 83 years old. And so, the house lay dormant for nearly 60 years on tail. <laughs> Similar to how Balenciaga was restarted, the rights to Schiaparelli's brand was bought by the the Italian Diego Valle in 2007, and the first collection since 1954 was shown in 2014, creatively directed by Marco Zanini. I guess there was some stuff that Diego Valle had to do in between 2007 and 2014, I guess. Business to attend to. Zanini was quickly replaced by Bertrand Guillon, who stayed at the brand until 2019. Guillon took a very literal and loud approach to Schiaparelli that felt a bit strange looking at it now. He went all in on the shocking pink color that Elsa herself created back in the day. And I think the main problem with his work was that he was trying to embody Elsa Schiaparelli herself when she was working back in the early 1900s, rather than adapting her work for the modern day through his own design sensibilities. I feel like some of his work looks like modern day caricatures of her work, rather than a development. In an interview, Bertrand Guillon said, What I have in mind is to respect the house and the creations left by Elsa Schiaparelli. The project is, first of all, about Schiaparelli and not about me. A humble approach for sure, but not always the right one. And the house never came to much prominence under Guillon. In fashion, I think it's important that you don't have a big ego, rather a strong ego and sense of self, which I'm not saying Guillon doesn't have, but it doesn't look like he applied it. And well, the creative director that followed him, Daniel Roseberry, saw what wasn't working and went the complete opposite route when he joined in 2019. In an Oops. In an interview, he said, When I first started, I had no interest in tapping into the heritage because I felt it had already been the focal point of prior years. I really tried to re-establish the voice of the house and make it personal. When I felt that we had done that on some level, I was able to return to her work. This approach was pretty clear with Daniel's first show at Schiaparelli, where he kind of made himself the center of attention by sitting in the middle of the runway drawing the looks as they came on. This was also his way of introducing himself, that's why he did it. He'd never actually held a creative director role before. He had worked in New York for Tom Brown for the past 10 years as a lead designer. So he was definitely capable and if you know anything about Tom Brown, it's one of those brands that gets pretty close to making haute couture level clothing. In terms of creativity anyway, I'm sure also in quality. Also, I don't mean to make Daniel sound so vain with his initial approach at Schiaparelli. He doesn't actually seem that self-absorbed. He came with good intentions that worked and he is an amazing illustrator. His fashion drawing are a delight. I love a good stylized fashion drawing, like a good one. I think because I'm mediocre at it, so I, I have no idea how he does this. They're so amazing. While he may not have been too direct in referencing Elsa's work at first, he used surreal motifs and ideas like displacement to evoke the spirit of her work. He even created his own personal surreal looks with these voluminous cloud dresses, which looked like they were devised through surrealist 
automatism, a method where you suppress your conscious control over the making process and let your unconscious mind to have great sway. It's, it's fun, you should try it. You might be surprised what your subconscious has in store for you. Once Daniel had established himself and a new direction for the brand, he returned to the brand's archive and was blown away by the quality of her work. He not only began to reference Elsa more, but also those that referenced her before him, like Yves Saint Laurent, who was frequently inspired by Elsa. But that didn't mean he stopped looking to today's pop culture as well. Like when he took inspiration from modern sci-fi epics like Dune, Interstellar, and Arrival to create the wardrobe of an intergalactic goddess with his Spring Summer 22 collection. Daniel Roseberry has brought such richness to Schiaparelli, and he hasn't been afraid to dream big, and which the nature of couture allows you to do so. And paired with the nature of Schiaparelli, which is to be as absurd as possible, it's it's a match made in heaven. Kind of funny it's a match made in heaven, actually, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. There are a couple things that I want to expand on, which I think point to the success that Daniel has had at Schiaparelli. And it starts with how he began at the brand, by making it about himself and getting introspective. To do something like that and to do it successfully requires a high degree of self-assurance, which I think Daniel definitely has if you read any interview with him. He was born in Plano, Texas, a relatively sleepy city to born-again Christians. His dad was literally a preacher in a church that he founded the year Daniel was born. See how the whole match made in heaven thing was funny? Yeah. Yeah. Funny. I'm sure you could already imagine the torturous time Daniel had as a gay guy in Texas surrounded by religion. Not only from the people around him, but within himself as well, being a Christian. He repressed his sexuality throughout his young life and even tried to be a Christian missionary for a year. But inevitably, he moved to New York to study fashion at FIT, where there and subsequently at Tom Brown, he found a new life for himself. Now, I'm not a big believer in suffering as a form of character building. But there's no doubt that the various hardships that you experience throughout your life cause great reflection and introspection. Daniel described his childhood as one of searching and longing and often daydreaming. In interviews, the way he talks about his life is in such an analytical way that he draws wisdom from it. And he brings that into fashion with him. For his love of fashion, he says that I think most people design clothes because they love this industry or because they love dressing women. And that is not me at all. For me, it's about triggering a deep, deep emotional response from people, which I don't want to say there is a right approach to fashion, but if there was, I think that's it. Daniel's mantra for each season is to have people weeping in the front row. And as hard as it is to get that these days when, you know, 90% of the audience are looking at the collection through their phones, don't know why you'd show up to do that. I think Daniel more or less evokes that response through his ethereal collections. I wanted to highlight his past before getting onto his design, because I think to get to this point, it doesn't just take practice of a mechanical skill like drawing or designing in order to elicit this kind of response to your clothes. I think it also takes a level of emotional maturity and introspection. Each season, the collections tend to draw some inspiration from a personal place from Daniel's life, which he still manages to weave in with what attracts him to the spirit of Elsa. I think this is something that other couture houses should try to mimic more, but maybe it's something that can only be accomplished at Schiaparelli. Let me explain. Haute Couture allows you to go deep with the clothes you produce. While the clothes you see at Paris Couture Week are definitely more compelling than ready-to-wear shows, I still think that most brands don't go far enough. If you compare the couture that Christian Dior himself made back in the 40s to what the Christian Dior house produces now, I wouldn't say it's got worse, but not much has really changed. If anything, it's become more subdued. And I think this is what makes Schiaparelli so special. It feels like all of these other famous designers like Chanel, Dior, even Balenciaga always designed for a specific archetype, like the Chanel woman or Dior woman. Elsa herself was pretty multifaceted, as I talked about, with how she dressed during the day and then at night. At the same time, her clothes took more of an art-driven approach that wasn't chasing the trends of the time. When Dior came in with his new look, Elsa didn't flinch, which did inevitably cause her business to fail, but she had already done what she needed to do, and she kept her integrity in the process, which is something that transcends trends. That's why her clothes do still feel of their time during the Surrealist movement, but the ideas around them are still fascinating today. It doesn't feel like there is such thing as a Schiaparelli woman. I think the brand encompasses a wide range of people that share Elsa's flamboyance. I don't think most people want to be extravagant at all times, but when it is your time to be extra, your moment of escapism from mundane everyday life, it's, it's Schiaparelling time, let's be real. Like, how are these regular-ass double-breasted suits on the couture runway? This is all just my opinion, of course, about other houses being a bit boring. But what isn't a matter of opinion is how Schiaparelli produces truly otherworldly couture. Not every look has a lion head or a pair of golden lungs, but every outfit has something that's captivating. There's varying levels of flamboyance at play in every look. I think there is genuinely something for everyone in a Schiaparelli collection. And as Daniel said, he wants people weeping in the front row. With that mentality, 
everything you put on the runway has to be extraordinary. A big source of inspiration for his work is his daydreaming, which is very appropriate when trying to achieve that dreamlike aura to your clothes that you imagine haute couture is like before you actually look into it and realize most of it isn't. I think that because Schiaparelli was a relatively smaller brand due to it being dormant for over 60 years and then not having quite the massive revival when it was brought back, Daniel and the team were able to take risks with their designs, which paid off. You may want to attribute some of their excess to the amount of celebrities that started wearing Schiaparelli, like Lady Gaga, Bella Hadid, Emma, Emma Watson, Adele and OG supporter of the brand even before Daniel Tilda Swinton, shout out. Even though Daniel says that he loves engaging with these figures that are creating pop culture, he explains that we've never paid anyone and we've never really reached out to anyone either. It seems like these celebrities are drawn to the allure of the house and Daniel's take, like the rest of us, who will probably never see a Scaparelli piece in real life, but can enjoy it through the internet. It's kind of crazy how wide the appeal is. I'm sure Daniel being the only American at a couture house also helps draw celebrities, but I don't think that would be enough, especially if the brand is isn't trying that hard to get these big names. I think that's all I have to say really. I, I don't see Scaparelli as this ultra deep brand that needs 20 minutes of analysis because for the most part I think that the clothes just speak for themselves including why celebrities want to wear them and the huge personality of Elsa herself backing them is even more of a draw. I think people are inherently attracted to that type of strange but heavenly beauty that Scaparelli creates and just being able to reach that it's enough. It goes a long way. That experimental spirit is clearly still there at the house with their recent collection featuring the animal heads, which I'm happy to see. I'm happy to see that they're still experimenting. That is, that 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 is the good part. How it materializes being good or bad is up to you. Personally, I think the animal heads were interesting. They were entirely fake. No animals were harmed in making them. And I don't think that the move really promotes or discourages the use of animal products and fashion. Because it's a huge topic that needs a lot of systematic and cultural backing in order to really make much change. I don't think most people want to start wearing exotic animal heads or furs more now than they wanted to before the show. As cool as I thought this was, I still would never dream of it. And I think the people who already do it will continue to do so, regardless of the show. In the end, these are sculptural pieces. How is it much different to a lion sculpture made out of marble? I get that there is a more sensitive context around it, especially the whole idea of wearing the animal. But I think in the theme of nature and Dante's divine comedy that this show references, these pieces complement the rest of the show nicely, which features so many interesting nature-inspired pieces. And Daniel has used Animalia a lot in his shows previously through snakes and bugs, but I've never really seen people have much issues with that. The animals that he referenced here are more endangered, but I don't think this is going to promote more poaching. If anything, it might bring more attention to it. I know I personally looked up what the status of lions are in the wild, and yeah, they're rapidly decreasing. One thing's for sure, Scaparelli is definitely progressing fashion design. If you want to know more about what I mean, my recent Patreon video is all about this idea of fashion designers actually designing new things versus styling existing pieces in a new way, which in my opinion are two different things and happens a lot today and I don't see talked about. Anyway, I have a quote to end on from Daniel Rosebury that definitely helps justify my appreciation for fashion. My mother asked me if I wouldn't feel more complete as a creative if I was making clothes that impact people's lives on a bigger scale, like creating for less expensive retailers such as Target or Walmart. But my life didn't change by going to Target. It changed by looking at McQueen or Dior by Galliano shows. That kind of beauty was what inspired me the most. How sweet that he's now doing the same. I think we will look back at his work at Schiaparelli with great admiration, so make sure to admire it now while we have it. Thanks for watching. Never, never stop Schiaparelli. <laughs> Bye.